it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, the hardcore legend, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I'm doing great, and uh, it's officially the time to break out the Christmas stuff, right? Yeah, it is, man. I can't believe it's finally here. It's uh, your. It's the most wonderful time to be in the Foley family, is it not? It's the most wonderful time of the year. Period. For For every family. Uh, we're pumped to talk about uh, another one of your extended family mentors, Stone Cold Steve Austin today is our topic. Uh, he's uh, turning 58 this month, so we thought we would just uh, celebrate him as best we can. And tell us when you first met Steve. Oh, the first meeting I don't have cemented in my mind, although it may come. I can tell you the first time I saw Steve, and that's been pretty well documented in uh, Have a Nice Day. Uh, which was a towering New York Times number one bestseller I wrote. Uh, I I don't mean to brag, but did it twice. Feet so nice, I did it twice. But I talked about how how much detail you want me to go into. As much as you like. Right off the bat. So um, we were talking about the Nesty Plunge. Yes. uh, I think, was it last week? Uh, That sounds right, yeah. Um, And how I did that, you wanted me to estimate how many times I'd done it. I said I thought I did it in world class twice. One of those times, definitely once. You know, I'd have to rack my brains a little bit to see if I did it in world class more than once, because I believe I did. But the definite time I remember was a Saturday morning TV taping. This was where I had asked for and received permission to go home for five days. And that's where Eric Embry, the booker, got the word that I was going to New York therefore felt I was being hired by WWE because that's the way we always talk about territories. You're going to Charlotte, you're going to Dallas, you're going to Houston, you're going to Atlanta, you're going to New York. New York, I mean, there were so many other territories, but that's the idea. You're going to Portland, you're going to San Francisco. He said, brother, nobody deserves it more. I don't do a particularly good Embry. And then I had to tell him, what? No, 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 (laughs) no, no. I'm going to see my parents, and it would be seven more years before I got that, uh, before I could reply that I was indeed going to New York. So instead of just taking the time off, which in retrospect may have been the wiser move, but believing absolutely that there had to be a reason for everything, uh, I, I suggested that we do an injury angle with the Nest T plunge. And uh, so I took the Nesty plunge. It's a hard wood. It's a wooden floor, but it's a hard wooden floor. And there was definitely a little internal bleeding, coughed up a little internal blood. And may I add that when Akbar was interviewed, and Mark Lorenz said, uh, "Your man Cactus Jack was just dragged out of here," may have said Cactus Jack Manson because that's the last name I had at the time. And and the Akbar just completely disregarded it. He said, "Never mind that. Look at this expensive shirt." And I got it, like, oh, I get it. He is casting me aside yes. like my health is meaningless because that's going to come into play, especially that was a character fans were kind of gravitating towards anyway. And eventually, if I had stayed long enough, we would have had a nice baby face turn. But it was really nice. How, and Akbar told me right afterwards, he grabbed a jack. I just want you to know this is why I did that. And it made perfect sense. To me, like, what a heel, you know, yes. never mind that. Look at this expensive shirt. And because I did not want the fans to see me coming outside and congregating. And that was another, that was a problem Akbar uh, had with me. An issue, not a problem or an issue, or maybe an issue. A concern. Is that he was concerned because he said, you work so hard. And when you go out there and you're so nice to everyone, you're hurting your own career. Because it's the same few hundred people every week, every Saturday morning where the tapings were free. Friday nights you paid, Saturday mornings were free. And so people would see me continually and word would circulate that he was nice. As crazy as it sounds now in the atmosphere today where we all accept that guys, men and women have their personas, but uh, we ex- we do expect them to be nice, right? Yes. Not rude. It was, you were encouraged to be rude, even mean to the regulars so you could reinforce your heel image. And that's something I did struggle with. So, uh, but that's, Akbar was always looking out for my best interest. He really was. Uh, and he was a real pivotal guy in my in my growth process. But in order to sell that injury properly and not wanting to see the fans uh, see me come out 
unscathed because I was scathed, right? I mean, internally, but I would, you know, that thing will jar you, will shake you up. Feels like you've been in a car accident. I can say that because I've been in car accidents and that's kind of what it feels like recovering from that bump. I went up to the crow's nest. I don't think it was the eagle's nest. I believe it was the crow's nest. I could be wrong on that. And that's where family and friends could watch the matches as the sportatorium. And when I sat up there, uh, Chris, gentleman Chris Adams had his first class for his Chris Adams Wrestling Academy. And I may, there may have been one other two people up there because we were kind of joking about how, how awful these trainees were except for one guy. And that was the guy, the muscular guy with the long blonde hair. It was like, oh, not only does he look like a million bucks. Steve will always say he wasn't a body guy. Steve had a heck of a physique, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that it wasn't a perfectly proportioned bodybuilder's physique just added to the badass image. But he was definitely a well-put-together guy. He had that long blonde hair. And he had that indescribable it factor that we all only know when we see it. And there's a famous line in your uh, book you wrote um, that Chris Adams said, $3,000 might seem like a lot of money, but not when you realize I make that in one day. I did the old spit take. Like, <laughs> Look, I, I was making 75 but in fairness to Chris and everyone else, I did not know that main event talent usually got bumped up for main events at the Sportatorium. I happened to see the payoff list, like one of my last weeks there, and I was like, ooh, everybody else in this match is getting about five times what I am. But I was new in the, I don't look at it like, all right, I, I should have negotiated. You could say they should have paid me better, which they should have, but I guess from a company standpoint, if you don't, they say squeaky wheel gets the oil off. Brother, I was not a squeaky wheel for the first handful of years in the business. Then you learn the hard way that you kind of have to squeak once in a while if you want to be treated the right way. Did you first start squeaking in WCW or were you squeaking before? <sighs> yeah, WCW. With Magnum, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. That wasn't, that wasn't, I wasn't complaining about, uh, I wasn't complaining about a payoff. The payoff. I was saying this is what I think I deserve because I knew what other guys did get if they believed in them. And I think more so than any other place, in WCW, you were kind of pigeonholed into your spot based on how much you were being paid for. I think that they um, legitimized the amount that the big stars were getting by continuing to push them as the big stars. And that if you were not being paid, it was said... You could not be a big star unless you were making big star money, but you right. couldn't be a big star unless you were making big star money. Chicken and the egg. Kind and of. so that's why, even though WCW offered some great uh, programming, especially on top, they did tend to use the same guys over and over. And it felt like it was almost impossible to get through that glass ceiling. And that's a frustration that Steve and I shared in WCW, which would carry over to our beginning year in WWE. By the time Steve has his first match for World Class in 1989, you'd been gone for exactly a month. Uh, are you keeping up with Austin's rise through Dallas and Memphis? I or was. When do you see him again? Because I was uh, reading uh, The Observer. Um, I was reading The Torch. I think Steve Beverly's Matt Watch. May, yeah, so that was about, around in 89. It was around in 89? Okay. So I was reading those three. Like, I was kind of a connoisseur of the news, uh, for better or worse. You know, sometimes uh, you know, I remember when Norman the Lunatic was signed to WCW, and I was like, oh, there's my gimmick. You know, like, there's no chance for me because they have a lunatic gimmick. Although my character in Norman is way different. Uh, but I knew who Muckham Singh was by virtue of the sheets, and so I knew he was a good bumper and a really good hand, and I thought, well, there goes my role in that company. So I was keeping up with Austin and I was aware that not only was he very good, but he was put into one of the best programs, uh, you know, that world class had had in a long time and was responding to it accordingly. It's interesting when you think about, when you step back and just look at the parallels, obviously with the exception of Japan, he went to Memphis, you went to Memphis. He yep. went to World Class, you went to World Class. He went to WCW, you went to WCW. He went to ECW, you went to ECW. Yeah. And then WWE. Yeah. Uh, you guys are kind of on the same timeline, just at different times, mm -hmm. right? 
With the exception of, you know, hardcore stuff in Japan, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And I had a longer stay in ECW. Right. But I think that, uh, I know we're jumping ahead, but we tend to do that on yeah. Foley's Pod, that Steve's growth in ECW, phenomenal. even though he wasn't there very long, was just phenomenal. And probably, I could be wrong, and he may have addressed this, addressed this but we all, we all struggle with confidence issues somewhere along the way. You know, if somebody's confident all the time, they're probably um, uh, just on the wrong side of being delusional. Yes. So I think we all need confidence boosters, and whether it's somebody like Robert Fuller reaching out to me when I was in Memphis saying, Jacko, you're going to make it in this business, when nobody else thought I was, uh, or, or you can tell by the way the fans are reacting. We all need that little boost, and I think that Steve's time in WCW made him, in ECW rather, made him feel like he wasn't just, didn't just, ha did not just have a future as a great worker, but as a great character and a great attraction. Because we all know Steve was a great worker, but if being a great worker was all you needed, there never would have been a FedEx envelope arriving at his house, That's right. letting him know that he was his services and WCW were no longer required. How much of the credit does Paul Heyman deserve for that, for being able to sit guys like yourself or Steve down and just look into the camera and spend some time? It's not a 30-second promo. It's yeah. an extended promo. It's just them coming through the screen. Uh, is that a method to the madness? Yeah. I think Paul deserves a ton of credit for creating an environment where people could grow. So for those who've heard my master gardener, example before over the years i apologize but to me it's the perfect one and it's uh there was a peter sellers movie called being there which was outstanding that we had to uh watch for a class in interpersonal communications in college because this guy is literally a gardener but when he speaks about gardening the people who listen take it like he's speaking in some abstract form about uh you know he's using gardening as a metaphor but he was using gardening literally as gardening. So in this case, I am using it as a metaphor where Paul Heyman was the master gardener. Some, some plants, AKA wrestlers, would need more attention. And then others would just need a little bit of fertilizer and sunshine. And that's how they bloomed. And so for a guy like Steve, and I'll say a guy like myself, we just needed that little bit of attention. We didn't need to be hovered over we needed the freedom to create, and with it, the freedom to fail. Nobody succeeds without failing on a grand basis. I don't know if the women of, t well, I think it's more, more with uh, Triple H, there's not that pressure cooker feeling. But I think the men and women in WWE were so afraid to fail that they weren't playing to win. And that's why, uh, you know, uh, using baseball now as a metaphor, baseball works best with wrestling, right? Like, you want to hit that ball out of the park. Yes. You don't want to single cleanly up the middle, and that's what we had a lot of times with just a bunch of clean singles up the middle, and okay, that was good, that was good, that was good, but we were reducing drastically the number of moments where people just went, oh my God, look at that ball sail. Yes. And I think the only one who had that ability in the, and was given that leeway was Bray Wyatt. Because Moxley was like a different man yes. from the moment he uh, stepped foot in the AEW ring. And I just think that constant need to avoid failing is not conducive to succeeding on a grand scale. Well, let's talk about Steve in WCW. He joins in May of 91. Very quickly, he wins the TV title over Bobby Eaton, another one of the all-time greats. And uh, that's one of the things that WCW gets hit on a lot is that they don't push stars and they don't create stars. But damn, man, winning the TV title right away, they believe. Big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. Before we fully embrace Steve's time in WCW, I just want to go back to that program he had with Chris Adams. Yes. It went on for eight to ten months, and that's working at the Sportatorium every single Friday night. Gotta get creative. You have to get creative. And I was surprised uh, to, to read, I guess it was in uh, Genie's, uh, you know, that's yeah, maybe it's a murky area is whether it's uh, a good thing or a bad thing from Steve's standpoint to be referring to Genie's uh, book 
but she said that Chris had pushed that angle in WCW for Steve, and Steve's feeling was, we've already done it. Yeah. Yeah, that it, even if it was new to 90, 90%, I mean, uh, world yeah. class or USWA still had their syndication package. So I'd say new to 90% of WCW fans, for Steve, it would have felt like going through the motions. And he was never into that. He was always a guy that wanted to be as good as you can be. But I think we need to take our hats off because I think in the Observer, for few to the year, that was really high up there. We can maybe check. That would have been 1990 uh, feud of the year. Yep. yep. Grillo, can we get on that and see yeah, if... Yeah, 1990. Uh, you're right. Observer feud. Because he comes into WCW in May of 91. Yeah, and yeah. I guess we should mention he meets his wife, Jeannie, Lady Blossom, as we're going to see her here in WCW, yeah. while working for World Class. Yeah. So uh, it is a great angle. Chris Adams, one of those maybe forgotten names to wrestling history. I don't think enough people talk about him enough. Wow. The innovator of the super kick. And he was the first yeah. the super kick in wrestling, right? Yeah. And I work with Chris. Uh, I, I talked about this in my, my first book is that, um, and we'll get back to Steve, I promise you, but I don't, I think it's safe to say without a Chris Adams, we don't have a Steve Austin well said. as we know him. Because he didn't just learn to wrestle from Chris. He learned how to... Do a program. Do a program, and that's really important. So uh, Bill Watts, this is another little economics wrestling 101 lesson, and we talked about it a little bit in the Watts episode. Watts' success was based on the uh, the oil boom towns that he ran. And when the oil business was down in the late 80s, uh, before he sold to WCW, uh, they thought the best way to stay alive was to expand into the parts of the country where his TV was strong, watch his TV, but uh, that they had not traditionally hit. And that's where they started doing Ohio, West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania. And, uh, oh, yeah, we talked about that in regards to the Sam Houston story I, yes. I told last week. Um, and it was, so the first time Chris Adams was on the shows with uh, with Terry Taylor uh, Shane Douglas and I uh, drove them all around for a week, you know, soaked in every bit of information we possibly could. And so the next time they came back, about two months later, I'm thinking March or April of 1986, uh, or March of April of... No, I think the first time was February, uh, November 86, and they came back in like February 87. I had a match with Adams. Uh, 1,500 people in Ohio uh, high school gymnasium. And he just said, you know, we'll call it out there. I'm not going to do the English accent because I do, don't do one well. And he had a distinctive type of uh, British accent. It's not a one, to, one size fits all for UK accents as far as, and our UK fans know that. And when I was in that ring, Conrad, I just listened to everything he said and more importantly, listened to the fans. I'd never been a part of an atmosphere like that where fans were just hankering for Chris to come back. And now these days, a rear chin lock's not going to get the type of reaction it did in 87. But, uh, man, I'd never been a part of something like that. So that when Chris finally hit me with that super kick, it was the biggest response that I'd ever been a part of, largely because he had built me up to be someone so that when he super kicked me, he had beaten someone. So I owe a lot to Chris. Yeah. I really do for taking, you know, in a way, kind of taking me under his wing. And he continued to do that when I was in world class. And you're right. He is a guy that has largely been forgotten and probably not enough credit is given to him. When we think about the super kick, too, it, it was really a, a special move, a magic move, not only for Chris, but with Shawn Michaels. And then it became kind of commonplace. Everybody yeah. started to do it. And I think of it maybe like a DDT. I mean, when Jake did it, that was the end. Brother, that's the end. Hey, when I was in world class, uh, P.Y. Chuhai, <laughs> also known as Phil Hickerson. One of the things I love about wrestling is that when Phil Hickerson went, I think he only did one tour of Japan. Phil was this rugged, kind of mountain man looking yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. And he was over because he was a longtime heel who turned babyface. You couldn't deny his you know, his uh, his skills, you know, and his, uh, in a weird way, his likability. When he went to Japan and came back as P.Y. Chuhai, it was supposed to get heat because he clearly was supposed to be, have a, adapted or adopted 
uh, parts of the Japanese culture. Right. When he came to world class, they tried to put him off like he was. A, I remember Mark Lawrence, look at this giant Oriental. It's like, he's Phil Hickerson with a little makeup on his eye. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, he, uh, he, he, has a, he had a great run. And I don't know if I've talked about this in my book, and I know this is about to be, supposed to be about Steve, uh, and I'll be hard-pressed to even tell you where my Phil Hickerson story is supposed to go. Oh, I know what it was. The, 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 the Eric Embry, uh, You Are My Hero, just put it on reserve. We'll talk about it some other time. And how, how I helped, that was the first video that I did for World Class that I helped video Bob Von Gersky produce. Uh, now that I'm there, I might as well just say, like, neither one of us realized that in the video, which would be seen by hundreds of thousands of people, you can clearly see Eric Embry's Blizzard. <laughs> Pirouetting in slow motion <laughs> through the air, and it was an error. He dr dropped his dropped his gimmick, and I uh, did not catch that even in super slow motion. But Phil Hickerson uh, gave a guy a, um, a DDT, and the guy sold it for the finish, but got up quicker than he should have because he had a girl waiting for him out in the parking lot, and did not want to look weak. And brother. The fight that went on backstage, you know, was uh, it was uh, it was unsettling, and it was because this guy had not sold the DDT properly. Now the proper way to sell a DDT off the top rope is to be up and at 100 percent, you know, uh, less than a minute later. Right. Less than a minute later. So I, I I am straddling that line of the old school that really believes that every mat move should be properly sold. Uh, in the new school, which, you know, necessitates you have to do more to get the consumer interested. But there are a few moves that need to be respected. Pile driver, I would think, is the first one. Uh, and uh, close behind the DDT. You didn't get up from a DDT back in that day, brother. You wind up coming back to uh, WCW here, and uh, you're going to rejoin the company in August. Um, at this point, Steve's been there since May. He's got to be somebody you might think, Hey, I could work with that guy, but yeah. you're both coming in on the heel right. side of things, right? I'll tell you, more importantly than who's a heel or babyface, Steve and I clicked immediately. I think world class. No, I didn't meet him. I did meet him in Texas. Sorry about that. Because I I got a hold of Jerry Jarrett in uh, summer of 90 before I got back. Uh, it was after I'd left uh, WCW, I'm clearly before I came back in 91, and I was put on a Friday night show, coming back as kind of a baby face. And I did meet Steve there, and we hit it off right away. So that when I saw him again in uh, WCW, we were, we were riding partners, you know? There, not two, there was not a, you were in a group of four people at that time, almost all the time, sometimes more than that. But you generally had at least three people in a hotel room, if not a fourth. One on each bed, one on the cot, one on the floor, but probably more often than not, one on each bed and one on the, one on the cot. So let's talk through that. Uh, how would the the riding partner stuff begin? Does everyone start in Atlanta, or do you all fly to your destination and meet up there and wait on each other? For the well, car? you know what? In '91, when I rejoined, it was easy for me because Abdullah was my uh, riding partner. He was my tag team partner, and usually you had to have at least three people in order to uh, get the company to cover that cost. That's something they did that WWE did not do. They cover your rental cars. You do, at least when I was there. But because I have Ab had Abdullah, we were allowed to do it with just the two of us, and I was allowed to rent that caddy. So it's crazy that I haven't rented a Cadillac in years, right? You never see me show up outside. I'm usually in a minivan, right? Never. If I see a minivan, brother, I'm all over that thing. It's like a Lamborghini to me. Um, but I had Abby with me, and uh, so Abby and I rode together for a few weeks. We had uh, Brian Knighton, is his real name, uh, Axel Rotten, uh, rode with us, and uh, we enjoyed those times. But it was really just me and Abby until he left the company. We talked last week about guys that didn't want to put over people because of Japan. I right. was at the house show, I think. I think it was the day after. Well, no, I don't want to say what day it was, but it was an Omni show. And he was going to put over. He was asked to put over Dustin Runnels, and 
Uh, that was the last we saw of Abdullah in um, in WCW. So then after Abby left, now I've got to find my riding partners. And more often than not, it was Steve. So I really enjoyed that time with Steve and William Regal, you know, a few other people. But those were my two main guys for many months. In, so you try to get yourselves on similar schedules as far as when you arrive to the airport and all yeah that yeah yeah i can't remember exactly how we did it yeah because once 2000 hit and i was the uh, commissioner then i was getting into town when everyone else was already in the loop yeah and that's when i started driving by myself rooming by myself and creating the habits that have carried over for the last you know 20 plus years so let's say you guys are going to ride together how do you decide who's driving and who sits where <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when I was with Corny in the midnights, I was always in the back seat. I was a good wheel man. I was. Uh, uh, Steve thought I had the worst musical taste in the business. <laughs> <laughs> that might be why we didn't ride together in WWE. Uh, I'd say I, I, I rented quite a bit. I mean, I was a driver quite a bit of the time. Steve was a driver. I Honestly... I don't know. I don't know a correct uh, ratio to give you. Do you flip you. a coin for who gets the bed? No, every third night. The, the, you rotate. Yeah, rotate. Yeah, so it was uh, it was a democratic process okay. because we all <coughs> split the room. And there's that you know famous cookie story. I love bringing that to life uh, on stage. You got to go see a live I show. You got to see one. it live. And you have to hopefully, if I don't do it, request it. And what works perfectly about that is I've had great comics like Brendan Burns, uh, Jennifer um, Jen, Jennifer Bloodsworth, who's a WWE writer. Uh, she went on the road and did an amazing DDP. Tim Sullivan did a great DDP. But other times I'll just bring somebody out who's willing to drop F-bombs. And they get almost as much laughter and sometimes even more than the, the comics do. Um, but that came about because it was DDP's turn to be on the cot. Steve and I got beds that night. And uh, there's other stories I told, you know, involving Steve. Uh, again, touching on a subject we touched on last week that should not be funny, but were funny at the time. And yes. I'll, I'll argue getting, getting stranded on a gay beach, even in the year 2022. It's funny. It's still kind of funny. So, who the hell gets stuck sleeping on the floor? Nobody. And at that point, we wouldn't have a fourth guy. Yeah. And if we did, I would dare say that, look, you do the mathematics, right? Uh, I was a sleep cheaper guy. Uh, my first week in WWE, Vince McMahon saw me, stopped me to say hello, and he saw something behind my back. It was almost like when the Big Show had something behind his back, and Vince said, let me see it. Damn it, let me see it. And Big Show turned around on SNL and he had uh, the little fellow. Yes. Whatever his name in his arm. Chris Catan, man. Chris Catan, yeah, Chris Catan. He, he was like, God. Vince was like, look, put the little fellow down. And Big Show was like, can I keep him? That's what I was like, except when I turned around, what, what do you have there? So, or nothing. Damn it, let me see. He probably didn't say that, but oh, come on, Mick, let me see it. And I turned around, it was a book called America's Cheap Sleeps How to Stay Anywhere in the United States for under $30. So doing the math, if you're healing a room, which is a threesome, Three to a room. it's $10 a night. Yeah. If you are splitting a room, it's $15 a night. And not only do you have to sleep on the cot for the extra five, but you don't have the receipt for your taxes. So I think at a certain point we thought, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe that's a good five dollars to spend <laughs> but if it was just three guys in the car then you're asking a guy to kind of like spend a night in a room for 30 bucks and that was a little over the top some people have it pretty tough uh i had a kind of a magical experience today oh yeah a little bit magical yeah better than whataburger let's not uh, <laughs> let's not get crazy let's not get crazy so i was picking up my uh my santa stationery right because you know i i rate those mean Santa can't, he can't write every letter. That's no, just, he's busy. Yeah, yeah, busy. So he has ambassadors like me, and in my case, I do the handwritten style. I dare say they uh, come out pretty, pretty, pretty good. But right next door to the uh, uh, the, the printer was a, a barber. So I got the haircut, and I saw the woman had a uh, 
a jar for what they call angel angel wishes. Okay. And it's just a local person. This is not I know it's not a registered charity, but it's one person trying to make the wishes for a few dozen children of lesser means uh, come true. And so uh, I think I found a new home in a way to make a difference this holiday season. Man, that's awesome. Okay. So let's jump back into uh, Stone Cold here before he's Stone Cold. Uh, of course, now you've, you've rejoined the company. You're going to be back in WCW. You're starting to make some shows together. The first time you share a ring is Kansas City at a house show in uh, May of 92, where you and Steve team up to beat Ron Simmons and Junkyard Dog. Ooh. Any memories of your first time in the ring with him? Not a damn one. <laughs> so uh, sorry about your that. first TV match with him <laughs> takes place in late June. It's going to air only uh, a month later on Worldwide. Uh, you're going to be teaming with Austin. Paulie's okay. in your corner. You're going to lose to Ricky Steamboat and Barry Windham. Windham's going to pin Austin with an inside cradle. Whoa. What'd you really? Th- yeah. So this is after the, uh, the separation, if you will, of the Dangerous Alliance. And that Dangerous Alliance was so good. Big time. We talked about it on a previous show. Can I just, can I just uh, sidebar, bring up, go. sidebar it? We're talking about, this is made up of Hall of Famers, Stone Cold Steve Austin, yep. Larry Zbysko, yep. Arn Anderson, yep. Medusa, yep. Uh, Rick Rude, all Hall of Famers. Bobby Eaton. Bobby Eaton, one of the most, one of the greatest of all time. Yes. And Paul Heyman, who's certainly going to end up in the Hall of Fame. These were, a guy, these, this, was a, this was a faction that could have been dominant for a few years. Yes. You know, uh, granted, they were taking singles wrestler, people who specialize in tag teams, putting them in, uh, putting them in a different group. But man, they were dynamite, and they were a lot of fun to watch. And then it was just a matter of what was going to happen with the different parts once they were split up. We knew that uh, Rude was going to be okay, yep. although he suffered a back injury or neck injury shortly after that. Uh, Arn was going to be okay. Uh, Zabisco, by virtue of the fact that he lost a singles match to Cactus Jack. May have been getting phased out and went to commentary. And I think Steve was the question mark because Steve wasn't making the big money, the top guy money. He was considered a great technician and a great worker, but not yet a great character. And so I think of all the members, he was thought to be the most expendable. The, uh, the Paulie Austin pairing. I mean, what could have been right there, right? Oh, my Long goodness. term, can you imagine? And then, you know, as I mentioned in that, uh, with the shark cage, yep. with uh, Paul Lee in the, in the cage, Austin cut this dynamite promo that never saw the light of day because Watts hated it. That was the, Paul, you need to look at this in a different way. Look at this man. His skin is pasty, pale. His heartbeat is weak and erratic. And yet they were terrified of him which made him that much more dangerous in Steve's eyes. And then that promo never saw the light of day because Watts thought it was too much jokery. The genuine friendship with you and Austin here, I mean, not only are you tagging together in the ring, uh, but also making towns together. Yeah. Uh, you wind up turning babyface. So now you're on the opposite yeah. end of him for the first time in January of 93 at the Kobo Arena. You're going to team with Sting and Dustin Rhodes to take on Barry Windham, Brian Pillman, and Steve Austin in a street fight, and you pin Steve. By January of 93... Can I say, in my opinion, that wasn't positive for my longevity because that night in uh, at Kobo, the Cactus Jack chants were big. And... Um, that wasn't a good thing to be getting more chance than the top guy. So when I turned, <coughs> Mike Graham told me we already had a, a top guy, indisputable in Sting, and deservedly so, but they didn't have a number two. And as soon as there seemed to be a little, I'm not saying I would have been the top guy. But there was competition. There was, I'd say if, yeah, I'll go out on a limb and say if I'd been pushed a little stronger there could have been competition but that was a night where it was clear that detroit crowd at least that the people who chose to voice their 
opinions, we're voicing it for me. Aren't there certain towns though where they always yeah. cheer that type of character? Oh sh yeah, yeah. So Philadelphia. Yeah. And so whatnot. you well, the Philadelphia would love the heels yes. and uh, you know whatever. You, Philadelphia's a real difficult place to get booed in. You know, once you've earned their you know, respect. Respect. And so I, you know, in the ECW episode, we talked about the lengths I would go to get booed there. But yeah, so Philadelphia, um, Baltimore, New Jersey, New York, to some extent, Pittsburgh, uh, they would kind of be the harbingers who would tell you who your big baby face was going to be based on who they were getting behind as a heel. Look, I, this is, I know this is a segue, and I know we're on a time limit here. Um, but I was actually backstage when Kurt Hennig and Larry the Axe Hennig fought the Road Warriors. Okay. And I was only backstage because in that era, 1985, guys didn't have videotapes. And when I had showed up at, at a spot show at my old high school with a bunch of videos from Madison Square Garden, Sergeant Slaughter's manager asked me if I could transfer some tapes to Sarge. And as a thank you, they got me not only front row tickets, but brought me backstage. Wow. And I saw a young Kurt Hennig, who was clearly like a little beleaguered by the fact that the Warriors had gotten such an amazing response. And this was an angle that had a lot of blood, the beat down of Kurt Hennig, Larry the Axe came to uh, make the save. And Kurt was like, there's nothing I could do. They just love them too much. They're too big, too powerful. And so even in 85, the Northeast was strong. They loved their heels. It's just fascinating to think about, you know, the wrestling politics. You you were real quick to remember that show with uh, Ekobo, e e where you're tagging with Sting and Wyndham. W what is it about, or who is it rather, or do you just know from being around the block that ain't good? Does somebody say not good, Jacko? I pull it back a little bit when you come through. The hey, curtain. look, I remember Ricky Steamboat telling me that at the post WrestleMania three party, when everyone was coming up to him and Macho, that uh, that wasn't necessarily good to have overshadowed the main event like that. Um, I don't. I mean, I'm of the believer you go out and you get over as well as you can, and you let yes. the crowd make the decision. Um, I, I don't know who was in charge of those calls, but I do recall thinking, uh-oh, this might not be good. And what month was that? January of 93, so right before Flair yeah. comes back. Okay. Um, your, your last match with Austin is going to take place in Kansas in because April. Just skipping ahead, it was March of 93 where I lost my year. Okay. Um, and already by then, Rick was the the plan was in place to turn me back heel. If I had not lost my ear in Munich, <coughs> there would have been that heel turn. Ultimately, there was one in uh, September, August or September of '94. But I was able to kind of keep afloat and keep from changing because of the ear injury. But um, we would have had uh, uh, that heel change. So I would have gone from being the guy getting the most cheers in Kobo to being switched heel uh, for reasons that, uh, you know, uh, at that time we didn't even have 15 minute breakdowns. So if a, a rating came out lower than expected, you could kind of get the blame for the entire two hours or take the credit conversely for the entire two hours if you were in that main event. So it was definitely an inexact science at that time. But you feel like because of a rating or maybe because you were getting too over, they switched you back? The ratings were what was pointed out to me, that the few, that the matches with Vader hadn't, hadn't uh, resulted in a ratings, uh, ratings boost. That but, was what I was told. But, as you said, conversely, what had... Like, the, the, we're a time in the business where it's cyclical. The entire industry was down in 92 and 93 yeah. and 94 and 95. Like, nothing was moving the needle in a Well, positive. Harley had this mystery team, the Awesome Kongs, right? I believe they're called, this is before uh, yeah. Kia um, came in and did everything. I think they were called the Awesome Kongs. They were. And Jesse was making fun of their ring wear because... They, they're, they're big boys. They're big boys. And they appeared to be wearing, like cloaks of burlap or a lesser yes. material. But nonetheless, that reveal resulted in a big rating. So I went in, I don't know if it, to WCW, WCW offices, 
I don't know if it was to pick up a check because we did sometimes pick up our checks at the office. Uh, and it said, welcome to WCW, home of the 3.8. And there may have been another. Is that the same day you brought the call girl in to get the Yeah, check? it wasn't a call girl. It was an <laughs> exotic, exotic dancer. Yeah, uh, exotic entertainer. Yeah, not a call girl. What was her stage name, do you recall? Uh, I don't know if I should be repeating it. And I don't remember it right now. Okay. But yeah. And she was still weezerk in the gizimic. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was in there with a scantily clad young lady. Already under fire for hawking loogies uh, into the air, which Jim Barnett heard was, I was, I, you know, this is where I said, no, it drifted into the crowd. Like, I didn't spit into the crowd. The wind called it. It drifted. And then I was told no more loogie hawking. No wind can move inside of an arena. We've seen lightning summon. Exactly. Yes. Wind, uh, weather patterns change all the time yeah. indoors. We've been well in <laughs> there. Uh, so your last match with Austin takes place in Kansas in April. Uh, you're going to be teaming with Ricky Steamboat and Shane Douglas to defeat Paul Orndorff and the Hollywood Blondes, who are now the tag team champions. It's an elimination match. Uh, before we move along here, what did you think of Steve and Brian as a tag team? Oh, my team? goodness. We touched on this in the Pillman episode. State of the art. State of the art. So much so that it didn't, dep- didn't matter who was scheduled or advertised as the main event. Douglas, Shane, and Ricky against the blondes was on last almost every night almost not every night almost every night and i think it was because you couldn't you couldn't touch them this was so uh, shane i think it's short shrift as far as being a you know instrumental figure because he not only had that great run in ecw when the company changes it changed from eastern to extreme championship wrestling but he and steamboat were, were one of the great baby face like pure fiery pizzazz white meat babyface teams that uh, you know that i've ever seen it's fascinating to think what could have been because i think as the story goes steve was promised a singles push and there were going to be certain plans and then he finds out very quickly almost in the same day nope i'm a tag team with brian pillman yeah. and i think as the legend goes chris benoit was supposed to come in and be pillman's tag team but when pillman doesn't sign they pivot and it becomes Austin instead. I'm grateful we got the Hollywood Blondes the way it did. It wound up being a lifelong friendship for for Brian yeah. and Steve and and I don't know. We've talked about ECW increasing his uh, confidence. Yes, but this is the first we've seen of Steve as a character. Yes, and he was brilliant. He's kind of an understated character, but those guys coming yes. out with the you know with the. And spoof and flair. Yeah. Flair for the old and all flare that. Flair for the old, yeah. I mean, it was really good stuff. And although it's the second time I've used the word harbinger, I will use it again fittingly, a harbinger of things to come from Steve Austin. Did you put Christmas on a credit card? Don't stress out about that extra holiday spending. SaveWithConrad.com can help you consolidate all of your high interest rate credit cards into one much lower monthly payment. SaveWithConrad.com has helped families just like yours save up to $800 a month. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. And did I mention no payments until March? So don't make saving money a resolution next year. Make it happen today at SaveWithConrad.com. Uh, your final match in WCW fall brawl 94. It's also the same night that Steve drops the U S title to Jim Duggan in 40 seconds. Again, these parallels in your career, you're out of here. You're leaving. Steve's losing to Duggan in 40 seconds. So I'm out of there. Yep. And Steve clearly sees the writing on the wall. Yes. It's the Hulk Hogan show now. That's what it's about to be. And that was good for, for the WCW. Growth. That was good. Yeah. It was a good move. But one, having one doesn't mean you have to get rid of the other. That's exactly right. Although you could argue they would have had two of the three biggest drawing cards of that era on the same shows if, I don't know if Steve could have had that growth. I mean, but when you think through know. it, though, I mean, Razor Ramon had been through there. Yeah. Diesel had been through there. Yeah. Hunter Hearst Helmsley had been through there. Mankind had been through there. Stone Cold had been through there. You said Gold Dust, right? Gold Dust, uh, and they all just slipped right through their fingers. Um, Eric Bischoff, of course, famously fired Steve Austin by FedEx in June of 95. Uh, when you hear that he was cut loose, were you surprised? 
Yeah, because as a guy who got to see Steve every night, right? You didn't have to be a genius to. I don't think any of us could have foretold how huge he would become. But I believe, and I don't know if Steve's comfortable with me talking figures, but he made a he got bumped up, I think, to 185. I think that was the second tier. 75, 150, 185. He wasn't even a 225 or 250 man, which was the sign that you were kind of a big deal. And at 185 or 180, I don't I guess they saved some money, but would cost themselves in the long run. Well, he joins ECW in September of 95. He's still injured. When does he lose the match with Duggan? Uh, Fall Brawl, 1994 with you. That's September 4th? Um, I, I, it would have been September. Okay, yeah. okay, gotcha. I, uh, just a little side note, I traveled 42 hours. Uh, and now I know Australia to, uh, that was in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, Fall Brawl. I know it's not a 42-hour straight shot. But between driving through the mountains of Austria, catching uh, a train to an airport, to another airport, I literally made it, I don't want to exaggerate, 20 minutes before our show, before our match went wow. live. And so Sullivan, he really, uh, he wasn't a guy that called spots anyway. But the only thing I told him was at a certain point he was going to throw me uh, off the second rope to the floor. And he said, brother. Should I be on the apron? I said, Kevin, if you're standing on the floor, you'll never reach me. And my music played, and off I went. So we had one, we had one spot called. I think the Observer gave it two and a half. I thought we deserved another half a star just for a good impromptu brawl. Crazy match. Yeah, good. Yeah, good match. Uh, loser leave town. I thought they could have done more. I, w I went. I exited through the crowd. I thought after being there three years, they could have given me a better send off. Right. But it was what it was. And it was pretty good for what it was. Are you uh, are you happy to see Steve pop up in September of '95 oh, at ECW? Yeah, because you had been there for yeah, a while, so you yeah. knew what was possible there. I knew it was possible, but even with that being said, I didn't anticipate this new Austin. It was almost like he fed off the energy. Yes, because you would sit around sometimes for four hours after a show. This is after it wasn't a WCW situation where you would go in every other week for four or five hours to the uh, the, t the Turner Center. Turner Center? CNN Center. Yeah, CNN Center. same, same. Uh, this was a thing where we most of the promos were, were recorded after the shows right. finished, so you'd be there till 2 a.m. But far from being a boring proposition, you watched what other people were doing, you fed off that. In some cases, you had to try to live up to or maybe try to top what people were doing, and it was a really good atmosphere. So... I think I was there. I can't remember if I was there or if I saw it, but either way, I was legitimately sh not shocked, but surprised at how quickly he was able to shift gears and take what had been an unfortunate situation, which is his firing, and turn it into a major benefit for the company and for himself. First time we really get to see the real Steve Austin on camera. He, he does hilarious stuff, mocking Hulk Hogan, mocking Eric Bischoff. Uh, he's only going to wrestle for ECW twice. He's going to lose to Mikey Whiprick at November to remember. Uh, and uh, you and Raven are, are going to team up to lose to Terry Funk and Tommy Dreamer. And then the next month, he'll lose a three-way to Sandman and Mikey. Um, and interestingly enough, his first WWF appearance, because this is just a stop in the road for him, it's going to happen the same week as your first Mankind vignettes, January of 1996. How crazy is it, man? These parallels, we just keep going. He was there, yeah, like you said, for about... <coughs> those those vignettes ran for several weeks. Yeah. So I was following Steve by six or seven weeks into the company. You wrote in your book, I don't think you can overestimate the importance of your name in pro wrestling. A good name won't make you, but a bad name sure as hell can break you. When Steve Austin joined the WWF, he was the ringmaster, a gimmick that was mediocre at best. Looking for a change in character, Austin suggested a personality that was somewhat cold-blooded. The creative people got a little carried away with the cold temperature as opposed to the cold <laughs> attitude and sent him three pages of names that included Ace Dagger and Chili McFreeze. Ice Dagger. Looking back... At, Baron Von Ruthless, too. It's just crazy. <coughs> um... So can I give you my Howard Finkel? Please. Coming down the aisle, 
on a chilly 23 degrees Fahrenheit with his faithful sled dog Nantuck. Ice dagger. Done. Done. He's done at that point. Even with the middle fingers. Yeah, I know he had came with middle fingers last. So even with the knee brace after the fact. Uh, even as the great in-ring technician he was, if he comes down as ice dagger, it's over. Done. I'll tell you what's crazy, too, is, you know, we talked about how you debuted. We've covered that before. I mean, you debut doing vignettes and feuding with The Undertaker. He debuts The Ringmaster in an interview with Brother Love and Ted DiBiase. No disrespect to two people we both think a lot yeah. of, but that's right out of the 1980s. Yeah. The, this Mankind character is a character with a little more attitude before that was even a word, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was lucky, and I'd be uh, really interested to find out, and I'll do my research, and we'll try to get an answer to this, of where Steve's initial meeting with WWE took place, WWF at the time. I was always told if, if Vince had really big plans for you, you'd meet at the house. Medium plans, you'd meet at the office. No real plans, you'd be met by one of his surrogates. So I got the meeting at the office. To this day, I have not been to the McMahon house. And I'll be interested to find out where Steve's initial meeting took place. Yeah, I got to work on that. Uh, your character grows, of course. You're going to get wins over Taker on pay per view. Uh, meanwhile, Austin is being pushed as the new protege of the Million Dollar Man. It really goes nowhere until he finally wins the King of the Ring. And that show, King of the Ring 96, is a big deal for both of you. Mm -hmm. You get your first win on pay per view over The Undertaker. And he drops that infamous Austin 316 line. Did you happen to see the, the promo when it happened? I or did. did you hear about it after? I did, because I believe I was already done with my match with Undertaker. I'd seen Steve when he came back in after the Mark Merrow match, and he had the, you know, the lip was in need of stitches. Yep. So I think the story is he went out to get stitched. I don't know if it was in-house or out-of-house. He went to a medical facility. Medical facility. <laughs> 16 stitches, which only, which only adds to the legend. Yes, and then he defeats Jake in the final. Yep. Defeats Jake in the final, and that's where he drops that that line that sold a million T-shirts. And uh, the rest is history. At this point, we're going to be just going through history because the rest, at that point, everybody knows. Yeah. Um, you would write. I was approached backstage by a name, a man named Jimmy Miranda. Now Jimmy's approached a lot of men. <laughs> Can I, can I just tell you? Please do. Jimmy was openly gay, right? Okay. And he was loved, beloved backstage. So when I wrote that out, uh, that was one of like 362 thing, different things that were flagged for legal. And, they, and I remember my editor, Jeremy Ruby Strauss, going, this appears to be a reference to homosexuality. I said, it is. And he likes it. Meaning yes. he, I showed it to him. He laughed. He said, whatever you want. And then they had to get him, you know, on the phone or whatever it was. And he said, yeah, I love it. I think it's funny. And uh, and it made the book. But Jimmy was a great guy. and you Great know, line, too. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but this visit concerned merchandising. He had a list on a name. You talked about this recently. Yeah, I did. The idea yeah. being he's got all these different names. The Stalker's got 15 different items. Mankind's got some stuff. No Stone Cold merch. No. Mark Henry, every box was checked. Uh, Barry Windham is a stalker. Every box but three or four. Mine, I had th two or three things, you know, T-shirt, mask, which I said I didn't think the public should be able to buy. Maybe I cost myself some money on that. Steve came up to Jimmy and goes, hey, Miranda, how about some merchandise? How about a T-shirt for Stone Cold? And Jimmy just kind of hemmed and hawed, and then he said, Steve, I'm sorry, but the office just doesn't see merchandise potential in you. And... I think the diff one of the major differences between being in WCW and WWE is that in WCW, you were playing with other people's money. That's right. And in WWE, it was Vince's money. And if Vince thought you could help the company, he didn't care. If you were a friend of his, if you hung out at the bar, he didn't care what your political beliefs were, what your sexual orientation was, he was going to push you. And to his credit, he went from being a guy who didn't see, did not see any potential in merchandising Steve to taking full, full advantage of that uh, merchandising craze. As you mentioned in your book, man, you had 25 items for Mark Henry, <laughs> none for Stone Cold, and you would write, 
And to think, within a year, Austin's merchandise would outsell Mark Henry's two to one, two million to one. That is. <laughs> Did I go there? Two million. Oh wow! To one. <coughs> wow. Sorry, Mark. Hall of Famer. <laughs> well. Yeah. Oh. Uh, ooh. Spot the lie. Unnecessary pot shot. Uh, but a funny one. A pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, we recently covered Survivor Series 96, how you were really disappointed in, in the show for yourself. But, man, that match that Austin has Ooh. with Brett is really his coming out party. Yeah. You saw the attitude vignettes right before there. It was really grimy, black and white, the dogs barking. Uh, it was it was aggressive. It was a different look. It was a different feel. The glass break is here. The swagger, the attitude is on 11. And what a perfect dance partner in Bret Hart. I often wonder if Brett doesn't come back and instead he goes to WCW, who's the guy who helps move him up? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if there is a guy. Right. I think Steve's talent was too great to be denied. Eventually it would have happened. But maybe not on that same level. Correct. Like it would be everything it was, but with a smoother curve. Yeah. There wouldn't be that rapid ascent. So I think he would have gotten somewhere in the vicinity but not nearly as quickly for nearly as long. And it was a pretty short window he had as far as being a, you know, an incredible main eventer, only because, it, 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 I'm just saying statistically, it wasn't that long. And that was something I think was covered really well in the A&E biography, is that he did all this in a relatively short time. I want to mention that, in my opinion as a fan, there were really... You know, I hate to talk about performers this way, but there's three like A players in the organization, the way they're positioned. To me, Brett, Shawn Michaels, and Undertaker. Mm -hmm. Those are sort of your guys for the last few years. Yeah. These are your top guys. And to take a look at who they're paired off with, Undertaker with a recent WCW cast off, Cactus right. Jack, now with Mankind. Bret Hart, now with the former stunning Steve Austin, who's now Stone Cold. And Shawn Michaels was supposed to be with another WCW guy, Invader. Invader, yeah. And it just doesn't work out. Right. But it is interesting to think that we're going to use three of our top guys to get over essentially three new recruits from the WCW side of things and bring them up. Yeah. And it worked out for two of the three of you in, in glorious fashion. Yeah. And unfortunately, it didn't hit for Vader. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. It's almost like they just handed Vince the keys to the store, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let him have his pick, and we did uh, We did pretty well for ourselves. Of course, uh, you wrote this. Uh, my, my opponent the next evening was Steve Austin in what was the first ever Mankind Stone Cold match, or the first ever that Steve Austin and Mick Foley had been in, period. Steve's character was really catching on. He'd had a tremendous Survivor Series match with Bret Hart. Steve and I had been talking frequently about the contracts we'd been offered, and while not embarrassing, we're not nearly at the level of Mark Merrow. This filled us both with a potent combination of pride and anger, and we vowed to show Vince McMahon the error of his contractual ways. Without even talking about what we'd do, we tore the house down in a match that many called the best Raw match in several years. Mm. And there was nothing fancy about it. It was just a great give-and-take contest. But the intensity was high, and the chemistry was there, and that would continue through our World Wrestling Federation history. And that was one where our time get, kept getting expanded. And we didn't... That's it was, unusual. It was unusual. A lot of times, every time cut short, and we came off, I think it was Bruce who said, a WCW went into a break, and you guys were going so well, we just wanted you to keep rolling. And this is one that may not be as good as I thought it was at the time, because, you know, now, by the standards of the day, yeah. very few false finishes, you don't have the spectacular moves. But it's just two guys reacting and reacting, and doing it, uh, doing it really well. Probably wasn't the best Raw match in years, but I'd say it was probably one of the top 10 Raw matches that year. And what's interesting is, you know, I'm not going to say this is the beginning of the Attitude Era, but it's heel versus heel, mm -hmm. brawling, just an all-out war. It's not the simple paint-by-numbers old-school WWF TV. Right, right. Uh, at this point, they're going to keep you guys away from each other um, because you're on two separate paths. Uh, the next time you share a ring together, it's a big time moment. It's the Royal Rumble 1997. This is really Steve's coming out party. He had that awesome showing with Brett at Survivor Series, but two months later, it's the Steve Austin show, and it feels like the whole roster is thrown out uh, by Bret Hart while you and Terry Funk are brawling and distracting referees. Austin comes back in after he's been eliminated. Was that, that was 97? Yes, at San Antonio. Okay. 
Funny how 30 years later or 25 years later, 26 years later. I thought in San Antonio was 98 with funk. That's yeah. San Jose. San See, Jose. This funk here, th this one here is where they had Mil Mascaras and a bunch all of right, luchadors yeah. and all that. Um, and this is where I learned firsthand that where Steve was in the pecking order as opposed to, this is, I believe, this is San Jose. We have the signing after the show because it ends at 8 p.m., right? Right. And so we're doing the signing after the show, and there's hundreds, say 400 people in line. And I'm down at a table with Owen Hart. And, oh, my goodness, we better get through these quick. And after about 30 minutes, there's no more line. I said, there's, there's 350 more people there. And I get the word, they're here to see Steve. And that's where Owen says to me, he goes, Steve's the main course. We are like the side dish. We're like the sprig of parsley <laughs> on the plate. So all of a sudden, instead of rushing through, anyone who gets up gets pretty much a fully soliloquy. I can write for as long as you want me to write. So I've got nothing but time. And it's more embarrassing because there are 350 people there. Like 50 people came by and saw me and Owen. The bulk of the audience is just sitting there looking at us, and we have nowhere to go because it's a two-hour contractually obligated appearance. But that, that sucks. Yeah, that. big time, big time. But that was just a harbinger three times of well, things to come. I just want to remind everybody, we are coming up on the 25th anniversary of that show where we got not one, not two, but all three faces of Foley. And uh, there's a rumor that you and I might be getting together in San Antonio. How about that? We might be doing that. That's we right. Might be, that. might be doing that for our first live Foley is pod. I mean, it sounds like a good time to me. It sounds like a great time to break it out. So this is your first Royal Rumble, and of course, uh, you're going to be involved, but eventually you get dumped out, and uh, Austin does too, but as I said, he sneaks back in, he eliminates Taker and Vader, and then dumps Brett, and the reaction is tremendous. Uh, we essentially set up the final four here. Uh, the idea is that's going to get to our, our February in your house, and now we'll have a a surefire number one contender. Of course, we know along the way, someone loses their smile. Now it's for the world mm -hmm. title instead. We've talked a lot about 1997, but, uh, I mean, we've just done it episodically with you this year. But his rise is just continuing to build and build. And then, of course, at SummerSlam, man, it feels like it comes to a screeching halt. When Owen dumps him on his head, it looks like that's going to be the end. But in a weird way... It kind of worked out better because they had to stop, quote unquote, just doing matches yep. and continue to build that character, which is really where the money is in WWE, is it not? Yeah. Every week that Steve was away, every week that the uh, the fan base was deprived of the uh, you know honor of seeing him work, was another week where they just longed to see him and wanted it so badly. And so I think in the long run, he was better served by not being on TV. He was doing those great vignettes. You know, I remember one vignette where Jim Ross sent him a couple of uh, autographed photos and Steve had the bow out there and he was, oh, there you go, right in the gizzard, with, uh, you know, putting an arrow through JR. Um, so, yeah, and, and the payoff, I mean, the big payoff was Vince taking at what the time was the worst stunner in uh, WWE history, only to be dwarfed by the stunner he took at last year's Mania. But that was at the Garden, I think, was that September 97? When he took, yeah, it was yep. December, September, because that was the same day I did the three faces, uh, the uh, debut of Cactus Jack, and the three faces of Foley vignette against the green screen that took 12 hours. And that, I mean, people were chomping at the bit to see uh, Steve get his hands on Vince. And it was crazy, and... Um... I mean, he's, he's a much bigger star as a result. We're going to talk all about 1998 in the coming year. It'll be the 25th anniversary of it. But I do want to ask, do you think, you know, they say sometimes fame or success or money changes people, but you knew Steve when he was taking his very first lesson yeah. with Chris Adams. Did Steve change? Yeah, in that, uh, hey, they say it's lonely at the top. Yes. Steve was at the top. Yes. It's lonely there, and uh, DTA wasn't just a gimmick. Don't trust anyone. I think he took that to heart, believed it, and I don't know if that was good for his long-term well-being, but that's part of what made him so successful. But it is, I remember reading in Ted DiBiase's book, you know, Every Man is a Price. This is the one that came out, you know, 
old school, like 98, 99, yeah. something like that. He was talking about how almost to a person, the top guys traveled alone. Yeah. You know, I know Flair continued to travel with the you know, members of the Horsemen, and Rick liked to have company, but for a lot of guys, uh, I think Brett was a road warrior too. You get in that car and you're kind of by yourself and you learn to either, you, you learn to enjoy your own company or you you go stir crazy. But Steve, uh, yeah, he, uh, I'd say there was a change and it wasn't all for the better. Uh, 1999, you're gonna wrestle Steve for the last time. It's really? SummerSlam, it's Minneapolis, the governor Jesse Ventura yeah. is the referee. You pin Austin to win the title. I think Austin's neck was really hurting him by this point, was he not? Yeah. Because he's yeah. out Survivor Series 99. Survivor Series, right, yeah. Because Steve, when he came back, he didn't alter his style. Even after his neck surgery, he still came back and he took German after German. Steve was a workhorse. He really was. And, uh, man, I, I dropped that title after only... Uh, Less than 24 hours later, but winning it from Steve, having Jesse hold my arm up in the air, to get to give you an indication of how over Steve was, when uh, when uh, Jesse kicked Shane out of the uh, the ringside area, and Steve got up on the t s bottom rope to like say you're out of here, he slipped and he flipped over and he got caught up in the same way that the hangman took off my ear, and Steve couldn't get out. Right. We could. The only way we could have got him out, and eventually did, was to actually take his lower body and actually push it back over. But that took about a minute. Any other guy would have been eviscerated by the crowd, and it was like the people in Minneapolis chose to see what they chose to see, which was not Steve in an awkward situation, um, but something else. I'm pumped to uh, to talk about Steve in this era because. Man, when you think about how big of a star Steve was when he had to go get that neck surgery, I don't think anybody's ever been hotter ever in wrestling. I mean, it would almost be akin to like, imagine if as soon as Hogan slammed Andre, he was on the shelf for a year. Yeah. Like that, you just couldn't even imagine what that would be like. But by this point, the supporting cast in the WWF is so strong with you, The Undertaker, The Rock, on and on. The Rock on. would be the guy. How can you possibly replace a Steve Austin? Mm -hmm. And we did it with a guy who going on to be an even bigger star in the mainstream than Steve. And a guy who had been in the company for like three years at yeah. that point. I mean, Incredible. you're talking about a young guy. <clears throat> to have either of those two guys taken off with the trajectory they did, and especially to have someone following in uh, in Steve's steps. So, you know, I'm not... I, I guess in some cases, it's fully as pod. We do kind of make it about me at a certain point. Sure. Uh, but I think St uh, when Hunter and I did uh, the Royal Rumble together, although you can make a strong argument that the Rumble itself is the attraction, and with the benefit of time, I can agree that it was. That's not the argument I proposed to Mr. McMahon when I complained about my payoff, though. Good for you. It good for me. But I think that was the first time a pay-per-view had not been headlined by Steve or Rock in a long time. I think. I want to remind everybody just how good that is. I mean, Royal Rumble is coming upon us. It'll be here next month. Go out of your way to watch Royal Rumble 2000. I watch it at least once a year. Oh, yeah. I think it's one of your best matches ever. I think it's Hunter's best match ever. I just think both of you guys are at the top of your game. It's brutal. It feels real. Uh, to have that type of match in front of that type of crowd, and then, you know, with that pretty gruesome-looking leg injury that Hunter suffers, mm -hmm. It's just uh, there's not many matches that are that are burned into my brain the way that one is. It's a great one, and uh, so much respect for Hunter because just a few months earlier, had it not been for Steve's uh, neck injury, I would have been out of the company. Yeah, uh, I'd already been said you've had your last you've had your last match when I told him I was having trouble with my memory, remembering where I lived. Uh, and it was only after Steve's injury we agreed, all right, we're going to pull together for a few final months. And I was broken down. I fell down a few times in the ring when I teamed up with Al Snow and we took on Crash and Bob Holly to the point where the uh, SmackDown match had to be heavily edited to uh, eliminate the Foley faux pas. And, uh, and the, so I did work as hard as I could to get in pretty good shape, but a lot of it had to do with Hunter making me believe that I was capable of competing on that level. 
I want to go on record right now and say that you have sold yourself short, and I just realized. How so? You've been on this program for months bragging about being Mr. In Your House. Yeah. I think you're Mr. Royal Rumble. Hear me Ooh, out. I okay. realize that other folks maybe have won the Royal Rumble. Yeah. Maybe even more than once, maybe a few times. But if we forget for a minute that the Royal Rumble is more than just a match, we'd be dismissing everything that you did. Because Royal Rumble 98, you wrestled three times, three okay. characters. The yeah. very next year, that infamous I Quit match that people are still talking about is one of the most brutal That's matches right, of all time. the Rumble. And then Royal Rumble 2000, one of my favorite matches of all time, you and Hunter, Dude, you're Mr. Royal and Rumble. And then 2012, the Sock versus the Cobra. Who can compete? I am Mr. Royal Rumble. You are. I'm glad. Now, if we can... It was me, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think we can technically sell a shirt that, that calls you Mr. Royal Rumble, but by God, we can do the our, our very best version of... Mr. Reggie Jackson. You're Mr. January. <laughs> Mr. January. Come on. It's, uh, a, Santa is here for December. It's a but come January, when that calendar rolls over, I'm looking at Mr. January. Also got a hell of a pop, brother, at the 2008 Rumble. Triple H and I square off, and there is such an eruption that I start trying to peer over his shoulder to see where the pop is coming from, what the source of it is. And yeah, I who realize, else is here? It's us. Yes. They love those rivalries. Yes. When they get a chance to relive that, they feel it. Yes. And it's one of the most rewarding parts of every Rumble is inevitably, inevitably you're going to have a few of those standoffs, some of which don't get the reaction that you think they might, and others which get a tremendous reaction that wasn't factored in. I remember when uh, before Mickey James and Trish had the standoff, it was discussed among people who aren't there anymore, and I don't want to pick on people, that the crowd might not remember that rivalry, right. which I thought was a load of malarkey as soon as I heard that. But when those two squared off, it was very clear that the crowd not only remembered it, but remembered it with great fondness. Well, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, talk about it. Hashtag it. Do whatever you do. Mick Foley is Mr. January. Royal Rumble's his show, baby. Um you do recur return to the company when uh, Steve is, is, is back and healed after this injury. You're back as the commissioner. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Austin is going to turn heel at WrestleMania X7. And a lot of people think that that's the night that we started to wind it down. Maybe in hindsight, it was a mistake. I know Michael Hayes has often talked about back in the territory days, you leave when you're on top. You don't wait until the crowds start falling because if you're on top when you leave, you've always got a place to come back to. And I think maybe Steve was trying to be a little old school and thought, I'm kind of running out of stuff to do, running out of opponents. But if I just switch to the other column, if there is this imaginary list with a line drawn down the middle, here's the heels and here's the baby faces, I can get a fresh coat of paint. But it feels like nobody wanted to see that in hindsight. Well, a couple thoughts on that. First of all, um, if Steve had left before the heel turn, there's no what, which right. has haunted us ever since. Yes. I'd say if you want to pay tribute to Steve Austin, be a trailblazer and come up with your own idea. Don't rehash something he did darn near. 20, was it 20 years ago? Yep. Or, um, second, without the, but to, to, that was a negative. The positive is without the heel turn, there's no mini cowboy hat. Yeah. There's no badges. There's no Vince, Vince McMahon saying about <laughs> Kurt, yes, he's a dork, but he's our dork, which makes him a dangerous dork, which was great stuff. Yes. But you're selling something that the public doesn't want to buy. But I think the fans, ah, there's a term for this, technical term, but it means that they choose to remember you in the way they want. So nobody, that goes back, and I'm not picking on impact, but nobody asked me about impact. And nobody asked me about my short term heel run in WWE when I, I you know, faced Ric Flair in successive batches because it wasn't the guy they wanted to see right. doing the way they wanted to see him. So with Austin, I mean, he's still going to have the biggest crowd. Yes. You know, when he goes, if, he, if he's at um, uh, WrestleCon, he's going to have the biggest line. 
you know, and he will make uh, an incredible amount of money for a very short time there. And that's because people remember what he meant to them during that run. But even though we say, okay, that's not the Steve people wanted to see, it was still Steve, it was still Steve at the top of his game or darn near close to it, helping make people who would go on to, uh, to fuel the company and then having those couple of dynamite matches after the turn uh, with The Rock. Or was it one dynamite match? Well, yeah, they, they did again. So they did 15, 17, 19. Okay. So there was one more WrestleMania after that, right. two years later. And then Steve would not wrestle for another 20 years, right? Correct. Okay. Until Kevin Owens. Uh, everybody's talking about what they'd like to see. It, 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 hypothetically, if Stone Cold comes back for WrestleMania this coming year, would you like to see him wrestle? No. He had the swan song, and it was a tremendous swan song. It was it was, it was my favorite match of the night. Uh, just because Steve went and did so much more than anybody thought he would. And that Kevin Owens <coughs> deserves some type of award. Oh, for Don't sure. Don't know if the Nobel Pre Peace Prize went to Kevin Owens last year. I could argue he should have won it just for single-handedly carrying that angle. Steve wasn't even on TV. I That's think right. he did uh, uh, one, promo. one promo by remote. Yet, yeah. I mean, and Owens calling the Texas landscape flat and uninspired is just a thing of beauty. It is. And then the next night, trying to cover um, cover up the, trying to create an excuse for his loss by saying, not only was he lifting weights, he was lifting a lot of weights to explain. So, man, there's a lot you can learn from watching how that program was done. And then, but the main, the main, main ingredient is that your guy coming back has to be able to deliver on a level or exceed the level that is expected. So hypothetically, I know you don't want to see it, but if Steve does come back for WrestleMania, because that is the talk. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see All right, okay. Hypothetically, if he does, John Cena, The Rock, someone on the roster. I think The Rock. CM Punk. Can I go D, none of the above? Yeah. I don't. I, I just think Steve did such a fantastic job. Of course people would love to see him in Rock, but not as much as they'd love to see Rock and Roman, in my opinion. Uh, maybe a Rock-Austin tag team. Here's what I really want to okay. see. The, the thing I want to see Steve come back at WrestleMania and do, hear me out, Okay. is you, him, Mr. McMahon, and Yurkle. If we could just put that back together... One time at WrestleMania. <laughs> hey, we came out at WrestleMania in 2016. Yes, I kicked everybody's ass. Sean should have come out after me, uh, right? But I came out after Sean. And then I had this great opportunity by virtue of the fact that not a single eyeball in the place was looking at me when Steve came out. That music hit, and I just thought to myself, I will never be in front of this crowd this size. I never have been. I never will be again. I'm going to look around this magnificent stadium for the next minute and just take it all in yes. and appreciate it. And I was able to do that because not a blessed soul was looking at what I was doing. Isn't it crazy to think that that's the most people you'd been in front of? 101,000? Well, even if it was, uh, a g am I speaking carny now, gizmic, even if it was gimmick, it was still 90,000, 88,000. It was a big-ass crowd. Yeah, big-ass crowd. Austin, of course, famously walks out on the company in 02. Instead of putting over Brock Lesnar in a Monday Night Raw match, were you surprised to see that cooler heads couldn't prevail on that one? A little bit, but more surprised by the fact that they would want to give that match away so quickly. Yeah. I mean, WWE gave away Austin and Big Show on Big Show's first night. It was the first or second night in the company. Yeah. With the idea being that by the time we do it again in a major way, at least a year will have passed and people will have forgotten. It's like, but don't go there. Just for the sake of storytelling, it should be the first one. I, I'm, I'm surprised Cooler Heads didn't prevail. You would think Vince, I don't know if he should have learned his lesson then, not to go on TV and uh, criticize people who are making, the, making those kind of decisions. Because in him doing that, he's making the same split second yes. uh, decision. Tit for tat. Right. And that's going to make Steve even more uh, resolute in sticking to his guns, which Steve's going to do most of the time anyway. 
Uh, he returns in 03. He wrestles one big match, loses to The Rock at WrestleMania 19. It's ultimately his retirement match, but he doesn't make it a big deal. He doesn't, he doesn't call tell it anyone a retirement ahead of time, match. No. Um, I wish we would have had a different send-off for him. Well, this, you know, going back to our episode on Beyond the Mat, what Vince did not like about it, one of the things he didn't like about it, was that he thought it took away the magic. I will argue that in WWE's own production, which was about that WrestleMania, even more magic was taken away, uh, that it was a much bigger downer than Beyond the Mat was because it not only had Steve having to go for medical treatment because of the ephedrine he, he took, uh, which he thought was a heart attack, but that Brock knocked himself out and had to be restrained by like 18 human beings when he came to. Remember, right. he, he did the shooting star press, landed on his head. It was like, this is a downer. This yes. is stuff I don't know if we need to know. And not only that, by virtue of the fact that most people don't even remember that took place, it didn't have the same hard-hitting effect that Beyond the Mat did. Right. So I think Beyond the Mat told a different story than the one we saw. Uh, but it was, to me, it was a more uplifting story. I can't even. Rem I think it was called the Mania behind WrestleMania. That's right. And I thought, wow, this is a WWE in-house production, and I guess they have to follow the story where it takes them. But where it took them was a pretty dark place, with Steve being on edge that whole day, Rock being loose and relaxed. They did tear the house down, but Brock nearly, uh, you know, is shooting star press at 290 pounds, almost ends his career right there. Um, so I thought that was more of a downer than Beyond the Mat was. Let's talk a little bit about the biggest stars. I'm not going to ask necessarily for your Mount Rushmore. Everybody does that. But I think when people think about the biggest stars in wrestling or certainly WWE history, they usually either say Hulk Hogan, The Rock, or Stone Cold. In your mind, who's number one? Oh, man, you're asking me to pick. This is just one man's opinion. If you're talking about within wrestling, I would say Hogan. If you're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, mainstream, obviously, Rock. Uh, but when wrestling was hottest, it was Stone Cold. Steve, yeah. We got a handful of questions here. Let's jump to some of them. Uh, wrestling Study Podcast wants to know, what was Steve's reaction to you falling off the Hell in a Cell at King of the Ring 98? I honestly, I don't remember. I know I've heard Steve talk about it, but Steve still had to wrestle. And I still had to go out and be part of that match. The craziest, I don't know, it was a, just that was a night, and I know we're going to cover the cell match, but it was a night of you know, so many surreal moments. Yeah. One of which was no, no one sat me down and said, perhaps you've been through enough for one night. Yeah. And somehow I managed to convince the powers that be that I was absolutely fine to do the slowest, most pathetic run-in in the history, and even Jr. was like, "By God, you know, like he was like appealing for cooler heads to take this guy out of the equation." But I think I did duck where I was supposed to duck, and the title changed hand by, hands by nefarious means. And to this day, Kane always thanks me for helping him uh, with the one title change that nobody ever talks about, and that's because that that cell it match had proceeded. It, it, yes. So from Steve's perspective, hey, I'm a friend. He wants to see if I'm okay, and B. Oh God, it's going to be kind of hard to top that. Yeah. But he's going to try, you yeah. know, and he did. And they had a really good match. And I think he worked that match with an elbow taped up because he had an infection in it. Probably. It's a first blood match with a guy oh, in yeah, a mask. Yeah, yeah. It's just a mess. Right, right. Uh, all thanks to you. And it's a red mask, too. Yes. So yes. maybe that wasn't properly thought through. A Russo idea, not all the way thought through. I don't know about that. Hey, if it was a Russo idea, it was signed off by Vince. Of course. And I'm a lot of people balls. in the room had a chance to go, how are we going to see that blood with a red mask? I love me some Russo. It's just fun. Everybody and it was also, it. Kane had the dark hair. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to show up like a nature would on a nature boy. Okay. But if Kane wore a white mask and bleach blonde hair that night, people would have thought. Would have thought, okay, I think he's going to lose, yeah. Uh, Sean Cold says, did Mick ever rib Austin and Regal back for the rib they pulled on him at the beach in Fort Lauderdale? The only rib was that they realized well before I did that we were on a gay beach. So I was out there, Steve says I was like a big walrus, you know, because I was a pale and pasty 290. The only thing that was tanned on me was my arms because I had an 84 Chrysler Baron, and that was my tanning bed. I would 
be there with the guns out, sun's out, guns out. Farmer's and, tan. Yeah, farmer's tan. But uh, when I was out in the ocean, yeah, basically I'd be tan from shoulders down, pasty pale white. And it took me about 30 minutes to realize why they had made the decision to uh, give up the Atlantic Ocean in favor of the Econolodge pool. And then that's when I realized. Uh, and then, so different time, different era. Sure. 2022, same rib happens, and I see nothing but dudes uh, holding hands and stuff. I'd, I'd realize they'd one-up me. I don't think I would have. I said it was almost Hasselhoffian, you know, with the <laughs> running on the beach, kicking up the sand as I went. And when I got to the uh, pool, those two were just holding their stomachs in laughter, you know. So I would think... This is the thing. If people want to say, oh, they're doing gay, anti-gay humor. I remember my concern when I was doing a story about Al, you know, Al Snow, and it was just taking a couple of, you know, unnecessary but quite well-received pot shots at Al, who is, is, is just completely straight man. The Derek and Romaine from the OutQ radio were there, and they said, no one's going to laugh more at that than gay people. So. Yes. I, I think I can I can't speak for every gay person, but I believe that generally speaking, they would find that to be funny. Uh, FF Handbook says, if you were still around during the what phase, how awesome uh, would the segments have been with you and Steve? And he put in parentheses because of your ear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we could have we probably could have made something out of it. Right. I meant to do. A, I was going to call. Uh, we talked a little bit in the little previous episodes about how when I really sit down, I want to write something as opposed to speaking about it, because you can feel the time and energy that went into the writing. And I started to write an article called "What's What with What," and I was going to say like, yeah, theoretically, a really good promo guy should be able to dig himself out of that hole, but you shouldn't have to start in a hole. Right. You shouldn't have to start the count at zero and two. Uh, I just think that's not the best way to remember Steve's career is by echoing that. Um, I, th I think we could have made something out of it, but it's thrown it's thrown a lot of people off to the point where I'll argue. When Mark Henry uh, came, did his raw promo on the heels of that great angle where he laid his shoes down and then he turned on John Cena, yep. that he had a really nice heel run ahead of him that was somewhat diminished by not getting out of the batter's box on the following, the following week's promo because of the what stuff. So I, I, I was not a fan of it. And I think, uh, I, I, Steve, for everything... Great that Steve has done. That's the one I wish people would just let go of. CJ Whitmore says, "Did Austin have any problems dropping the WWF title to you at SummerSlam '99? And what were your thoughts on the Smoking Skull Belt, considering you were the last one to hold it?" Hell, son, I think that was Steve's idea. I know it was. I was in the office when he proposed it, <coughs> so he had absolutely no problem with it. Um, what did you think of the belt? I liked it. Yeah, could you imagine if I had actually purchased that belt, what that would be worth? Brother, we've already talked about one of my biggest, oh, I'd, uh, other than being the man on my epitaph, who came, no one came through bigger when it mattered less, I, I would like people to remember that the reason I don't have a belt is because I auctioned it to pay for one of the guy's yeah. medical bills. So I think it's a really good reason not to have a title belt. I like the Smoking Skull belt. I did. I mean, I love the Winged Eagle in the grand scheme of things. That's my favorite. Yeah, that's my favorite. But Steve was a long-term champion, and he put his stamp on it. I think it was cooler than the Spinner belt. Yeah. And I think it's cooler than the huge logo. Yeah. Uh, I understand why the huge logo looks really good, you know, when a World Series champion or a Super Bowl champion is wearing it. But uh, I didn't. I liked the idea that the globe yes. and it was was central, and not the logo. Yeah. Two Count Kyle says uh, you've Eric has once said, maybe tongue in cheek, that him firing Austin was the best thing to happen to Steve, and he usually says you're welcome for extra added heat. But if Steve had stayed in WCW, even gaining momentum and perhaps main event spots. Do you think he ever would have hit the big time like he did in WWE? 
Or did Austin need that fire in him that Bischoff gave him after WCW so it could only happen with Vince? Or was there a chance that maybe Austin versus the NWO could have been as big? No. I don't think so I don't think so. It would have been big. Yes. Um... DDP versus the NWO was big, but it wasn't Austin big. Right. Right? And that was the main guy who yeah, rebelled him against him. Everyone else wanted to kind of join with them. And I think Steve would have run into a problem when he got to that glass ceiling. And he probably would have had a couple of losses to make it clear to the fans. You're not quite there. Yeah, you're not quite there. And, and, would ne- and never would be in that company. Well, we're going to have a lot of fun next week talking about your role as the WWF commissioner in the year 2000. (laughs) We hope that you'll hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you think we've earned it, throw us a five-star rating. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at Hey, Hey, It's Conrad. These days, our man Mick is hanging out over on Instagram at Real Mick Foley. He's also on Facebook at Real Mick Foley. And uh, we need to know in a nutshell why I got off Twitter. I was tired of dodging turds in the swimming pool. But eventually, Grillo is going to start swimming for you. We think so. We hope so. We hope so. We think so. He's got his turd suit. I'm reserving. I'm reserving. I know I said he would hand over. I don't know where I stand on that just yet. Well, just so you know, we've got a 5XL wetsuit for (laughs) Grillo to get in the turd bowl. He's ready. He's <laughs> the, turd trained. The turd, turd bowl ready. that Twitter has become. <laughs> uh, you can follow us on Twitter for the show at Foley is Pod. At Foley is Pod, in fact, we'll work on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We know what we're doing around here. Uh, and we want you to recommend the YouTube channel. If you haven't already, go throw us a like, yeah. hit the subscribe button, turn your notifications on. It's Foley on YouTube.com. That is the best way to introduce the wrestling fan in your life to our show. Foley on YouTube.com. Next week, Mick. The Commissioner Run. This should be fun. I love it. Let's do it. We'll see you right here on Foley is Pod. Yeah. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple Podcasts, or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad-Free Shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like Title Chase, Eric Fires Back, Conversations with Conrad, and The Insiders. Plus new series like The Book with David Crockett, Monday Mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick, and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early? You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus, ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch-alongs, Q&As, and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today, and hey, when you do, the first week is completely free at freeshows.com.